afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, and uh, thank you so much for joining another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me, as always, is our Chief Investment Officer, David Burroughs, who will be pleased to provide us all with a macro overview. And of course, at the tail end of the conversation, be happy to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can send those questions via the chat or the Q&A on Zoom. And on this lovely, cool November Tuesday afternoon, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pamela, how are you? Great, thank you. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. And uh, and glad we got a bunch of people on the line today. Lots of lots of stuff to talk about. Um, why don't we jump right in? <clears throat> um, uh, market continues kind of to progress uh, off the October lows. Uh, you know, almost like clockwork, we saw a shift in the stance of the market. And as usual, from a place where people were generally underpositioned uh, and maybe a little bit overly bearish, can't say how many times I've seen that in October uh, of the year, uh, obviously now into a stronger seasonal period. Uh, and so what I thought we'd do is just take a quick look underneath the surface uh, and see what's going on across asset classes. Uh, and as usual, just sort of uh, navel gaze a little bit about whether we're positioned in the right spots. Uh, what if anything's changing? I think that there are some changes out there uh, and, and kind of go from the top. So uh, we continue to be in a structural bull market stocks that started in 2013. And despite a 23 month interruption, uh, we are getting very darn close to making new highs. So but 23 months, structural bull market has been going on for 128 months. Market's up about 176%. Uh, since then, pales in comparison to what we saw by the time it was done in the 80s and 90s, which was up 1,300% over 217 months. Uh, and you can see that, you know, very often you get into a structural bull market, it can go on for 15, 18, 19 years. So, you know, room to move. Um, when we look at the last sort of 23 months from the highs at the end of 2021, you know, very typical sort of five legs down. Uh, into the lows in October 22, down about 24.7% at that point. Since then, it certainly has not been a straight line. There's been lots of things to worry about, lots of geopolitical risks, lots of economic risks, a very vociferous uh, Fed tightening process. But we've made a series of higher lows, including the one we made toward the end of October. Uh, and on November the 3rd, uh, barometers, uh, equity risk models that track equity breadth turned higher, uh, telling us it was time to put more money to work. We did take a little bit of money out of the market between August uh, and October. Uh, we always use stop losses, and, and the job here is to make sure that little mistakes don't turn into big ones. We were pretty happy with the fact that we did moderate the decline quite substantially. This was a 10.7% correction in the S&P. Equal weight, S&P was down 14% over that period. Uh, and there has been a very, very sharp rally ever since. You can see the market actually gapped higher four times in the first few days. Uh, we had very, very substantial advancers versus decliners. We talked a little bit about that data. And part of it was help coming from other asset classes. A big part of this decline in the S&P was driven by the very sharp run up in the U.S. dollar in late summer. This is the US dollar rallying versus the basket of world currencies like the Euro and the Yen and the British pound. Uh, and, and of course the Canadian dollar and the Aussie dollar. Uh, but when you get a very sharp run up in the US dollar, often that is accompanying concerns, geopolitical concerns, economic concerns, it's often a move to safety. We saw that in the early part of the bear market uh, starting in the beginning of 2022 just you know, an almost unstoppable run the U.S. dollar, which which uh, was invested with for safety. Now we pointed out things got overbought uh, around October of 2022, uh, and from that point, the overbought and the relative strength started to wane. You see a decline in relative strength, and that's when the rally got going last year. And similarly, we got overbought uh, toward the middle of October. Uh, we thought perhaps uh, we mused that if U.S. dollar trajectory was to slow. That could take some pressure off stocks. And certainly, you know, over the next couple of weeks as the trajectory 
waned and you can see the relative strength just really collapsing. Uh, uh, US dollar has been falling. And this is right up to today. We've now broken below long-term moving averages. We've made a lower high to the one we made in October of 22. I think that that's important. Uh, and now trading below all support. So probably the measurement, uh, next measurement is down into around par uh, at 100. Uh, we'll see. But we certainly have seen risk assets behave better. Same thing for the US Treasury bond. You know, every time US Treasury yields got overbought since the lows in 2020, we got some relief and that helped create a relief rally in stocks. So <clears throat> once again, we got overbought uh, around the middle of October. And over the last six weeks, we've seen yields come down from a little over 5% to today, 4.35. You know, we're back sort of into support levels. Uh, we're not expecting to see them come down a ton, but they certainly are moderating. So combination of the uh, trajectory in upward yields moderating, the trajectory in the U.S. dollar moderating, you know, happen to coincide seasonally with a time when things tend to get a little bit better. And we saw some improvement in breadth. So we did get a couple of really important signals uh, we mentioned last week when the Dow, when the S&P had declined more than 10%, held its low for 10 days and then gained in price nine out of the 10 days. It happened only four times uh, in history. And the forward one-year returns from that point tended to be very, very strong. Another interesting point, we have had a very significant pickup in price momentum uh, across the market. So the 20-day percent change in uh, stocks with positive price momentum is in the very top percentile, 99th percentile. We know that when uh, that has happened in the past, it tends to be the next six months is very, very strong. So just like when momentum really breaks down, it tend we send, tend to see a weak return. We see uh, uh, good, strong returns when we see momentum pick up. Sadly, however, people tend to vote with how they feel. We know that October saw the greatest net redemptions we've seen in several years. There have been net redemptions across both mutual funds and ETFs going back to the spring of 2022. And sadly, I'm guessing these people are sitting on the sidelines. So as it is always the case, we took lots of calls in October uh, people concerned about all the things they're reading about, and I understand it emotionally. It's no fun to lose money, uh, no fun to uh, to go through a period where markets have been uh, difficult and sentiment is is bad. However, uh, you know we know and we talked about the fact that when these things turn, you tend to get two, three, maybe four years of strong returns looking forward as people come and reposition. So we don't want to be completely out of the market. We want to stay in the things that are strongest uh, and make sure that we're focused on identifying market leadership. Outside of the US, Japan continues to truck along. Last week, we mentioned that we had rotated our Japan holdings from the DXJ, which is an ETF, which is currency hedged back to US dollars to protect in a time when US dollar was rallying versus the yen, to an unhedged version, EWJ, and over the past two weeks, EWJ is certainly outperforming the hedged version because the Japanese yen is also now appreciating. We've seen strength in uh, Indian stocks. We made a new 52-week high uh, today in the EPI ETF. Uh, this is an easy way to get exposure, sort of the top 50 Indian stocks. There's other ways to get other exposure, but it's very important to note that global stocks went through a long period where they really made no progress. And we can look at Chinese stocks, we can look at Indian stocks, we can look at Japanese stocks, Japanese stocks going back 30 years. Uh, but when they start to outperform, it tends to go on for quite some time. So I just don't want to ignore this. Uh, I know that people are very comfortable owning US equities. There's some great companies and some great sector exposures that you can get, but there are some things you can't get. Uh, and diversification, you know, is one of the only free lunches. So when a new theme comes out of a long secular bear market, you want to take note and do something about it. So we think certainly Japan is interesting and we've been there for about, uh, about 18 months. 
Uh, we think that India looks very, very good. We mentioned the last couple of weeks, you know, we're seeing a reversal of a bear market in the uh, Brazilian market, uh, which has been in decline really since 2008. Uh, and we've seen it strength across uh, the Latin American markets. In fact, you know, we are seeing strength in a lot of global markets. So just like we look at from a sector perspective, we plot these global markets based on the strength or the breadth of the advance, the percent of stocks within those markets that are in clearly defined upward price trends. And we define those using point and figure price charts. The average company on this chart, sorry, average country has 41% of stocks in uptrend, about four out of 10. The ones in pink are not showing expansion in breadth at this point. The ones in green are. So notably, Canada is not. Uh, it's not far from reversing up, but it has been slow to respond. We've seen strength in India. We've seen strength in Japan. We've seen strength across Europe, in particular in the UK and uh, Germany. We've seen strength across Asia Pacific. Uh, for a long time without China, China's breadth has reversed up from a very low level. We've seen all of the US turn higher. So there's a lot of stuff that we can be looking at and we wanna to try to identify and high grade. Realistically, we have a belief that you only need 20 to 30 positions in a portfolio. You don't need to be everywhere. We wanna target, we wanna target parts of our investable universe that are seeing expanding breadth. So moving on, uh, fixed income. When we look at yields, yields put in a generational low in the late 1940s and again in, in 2020. Important to recognize that because when they reverse, the things that do well during falling rates don't tend to be the same things that do well during rising rates. And it doesn't mean anything's a straight line, but we like to understand what's happened historically. We know that in the period when yields were rising back in the 50s and 60s, you know, we, I know that people have a view that stocks don't tend to do well when that's the case, but that actually wasn't the case. So we've seen very clear reversal in trend in yields. 1981, 2020, a reversal, we broke trend. And we've had some pullbacks along the way. And again, yields are pulling back, but by no means do we expect them to go back to the low levels we saw in 2020 or 21. QE is over. The Fed and other central banks have made that very clear. Uh, there is a tightening of financial conditions around the world, probably because there is sort of inflation that is underneath the surface. And while it is moderating, it's unlikely that it's going right back into the bottle. So we know that historically, when bonds get into a negative return characteristic during a secular bear market, you know, it can take a long time for you just to even break even. 35 months to break even, 1954 to 57, 43 months of negative returns, 1972 to 76, 54 months of negative returns from 1977 to 82. You really have to pick your spots during a secular bear market. Now, will we see a reversal back positive for bonds? It's been 33 months to, to October. Yes, I'm gonna guess we will at some point, but the question is, are bonds the best place you can put your money when yields are pulling back. Okay? We know that in the 1950s and 60s, uh, you know, bonds did give a positive return 1.6% a year during rising rates, but inflation was 1.6, it was a wash from a real rate of return standpoint. Stocks were a totally different picture, 15.1% a year. And again, they moved in fits and starts, but it was like four steps forward and one step back. So, Stocks relative to bonds are outperforming. They have been performing since the yields low in 2020. They did moderate through 2022. Stocks and bonds both down about 21%. But since 2000, beginning of 2023, the S&P is steadily outperforming bonds. And even though bonds have rallied since the end of October, stocks are rallying more. When we look underneath the surface, dividend growers are outperforming high dividend paying stocks. We've made the point that in a, in a period where rates are rising, 
or in a secular bear market for bonds, it tends to be you want to own things that have an improving ability to pay or a rising stream of dividends. And again, not a straight line, but we've seen since the stock market low in the fall, actually since the early summer of 2022, before the market made a low, dividend growth stocks started to outperform high dividend payers for total return. And that continues to be the case. So just to put a point on that, if we look over the course of the year, the equally weighted S&P total return is about 5%. And that's because it takes out the impact of the, those seven large companies that have generated such significant returns. The dividend growth ETF, RDV, RDVY, with arguably lots less volatility, is up 7, 9.7%. The high dividend paying ETF uh, down 4% over the same period. What a delta between those two. The bond market from the beginning of the year is up 1.3% for the aggregate bond market and the Canadian bond market up 2.2. This dividend growth category is one that we want to focus on in the world that we're in. And unless that changes, that is important leadership. When we look at the period just since stocks made their turn October the 30th, Equal weight S&P up 8.8%. The dividend growth ETF up to same. High dividend paying stocks up 5.9. Aggregate bond index up 3.9. So yes, the people that bought the dip in the bonds are making money, but it doesn't compare from a total return standpoint or certainly not from an after-tax standpoint. Okay, commodities. Long-term picture for commodities turned in 2020 and has been rallying since then. They consolidated during the period the Fed was tightening. The market started to look beyond tightening five months ago uh, and certainly look as though they plan to go higher. Copper, which we talked about last week, after a very long bear market going back to 2011, uh, broke out of a consolidation over the last couple of weeks, and we have maintained that breakout I think that's positive, especially given the fact that so many people think we're headed to recession, and that has to mean that commodity prices are going lower. Something's going on here. Uh, 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 inventories are low. Chinese smelters can't get enough copper concentrate, uh, and there's very little that's coming on by way of new supply. New this week. We've talked a little bit about this large cup and handle formation or this technical formation in gold. If we are to close here for the month, these are monthly bars, this would be a new high monthly close for gold going back over the last number of years. And to put it in perspective, you know, this is this bear market and consolidation in gold it goes back to 2010. And here we are sitting at a new monthly high. So we're a couple of days away from the end of the month. So I questioned whether to put this up or not. My guess is, given the action today, it is likely going to close here, maybe higher. Uh, and that has some big implications for some opportunity uh, as to place to make money. So commodities, once they start to outperform stocks, tend to, tends to go on for quite some time. It's, again, it's not a straight line, but we want to keep that on our, in mind in our backdrop. Our job is to understand the backdrop and make sure our portfolios are positioned and tilted in the direction of the sectors and themes that are seeing imp improving breadth. We don't have to be everywhere. So we're trying to find the asset classes that have a tailwind, the geographic regions within those areas. We want to find the sectors or themes that are benefiting from whatever the structural shift is that's taking place. And I would say this shift in interest rates is a huge structural shift going from a world where the borrower was in control, where free money was you know, very advantageous to certain industries, to a world where the lender is in control and where sources of capital are dear. Our job is to recognize these changes and, and be prepared to play defense in the event that nothing's working. So it is a tactical approach. Qu very quickly, um, just as a reminder, we think that 70 to 80% of return comes from getting to the right neighborhood, right asset classes and sectors within those neighborhoods, those with a tailwind, so we have a top-down model that takes all the areas that we could focus in. We track breadth across all of those groups to identify only those that have a tailwind where we're seeing expanding breadth. In other words, there's money getting put to work. People care. 
We have a second set of tools to try to find securities to express our view. And we take 60,000 global securities, we run them through some tests looking for securities that are good getting better, where we can see in the fundamental characteristics, there is improvement in the fundamentals. And we're also seeing improvement in, in, um, in price behavior or the technical characteristics. If we can find companies that are showing net improvement in the fundamentals and improvement in the technicals, and they are good to begin with, you can get multiple expansion that could go on over a period of time. So we can find securities that meet those tests in areas of the market that people care about. This is where we're gonna find return. The top-down work is all about finding areas that maybe have been out of favor for a period of time, where we start to see expansion and breadth. We look for the securities that meet our tests. And as long as breadth is expanding, we know we got a tailwind. There's no bear market ever took place while breadth was expanding. Now, sometimes you go through periods like the last 23 months where there's been lots of back and forth. And that's frustrating, but we know that ultimately bear markets come to an end. And on the other side, the groups that show the best breadth expansion and the best relative performance tend to be the groups that continue to lead. And we stay there so long as breadth is strong. When we see breadth contract, it means we got to pull in our horns. We've got to tighten up the stop losses. We got to stop putting new money to work. And we got to sit on our hands until we see improvement, maybe in another part of the market. So it's a very tactical approach. It's meant to be very defensive when things are sloppy and it forces us to put money to work when it feels uncomfortable. And that's one of the most important things. I can tell you, nobody we talked to at the end of October wanted to put any money to work. But as it turns out, not a bad place. At the end of October, our breadth models were solidly negative. Red across the board, meaning contraction and breadth. As of November the 21st, things were improving. And as of November the 28th, they've continued to improve. So percent of stocks and uptrends in the NYSE, just about 50%, almost one in two. The higher the percentage gets, the easier it is to make money because the higher and higher percent of stocks are behaving constructively. When we look at the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving averages, you can see in Canada, the US and globally, we're over 50% of stock trading above their short-term moving averages. And 90% of companies trading with positive weekly price momentum. So we talked over the last few weeks about the very significant thrust in momentum. Percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows continues to rise. And now over 50% of companies in the U.S. are trading above their long-term moving average, which is a good uh, trend measure. A percent of stocks trading above their 150 week, sorry, 150 day moving average. Breadth is expanding at a time of year that tends to be important. When we look at the sectors, if we plot them on a distribution curve, as of the end of October, the average sector had only 24% of stocks and uptrends, but they're not all the same. Sectors in this column had only between zero and 14% of stocks performing well. And we had some groups that have been behaving better at this end of the spectrum. When we look at things as of last night, the average sector has 38% of stocks in uptrends today. You can see we're moving to the right. You can see the preponderance of evidence is that the most of these sectors are noted in capital letters, which means that breadth is improving in each of those with capital letters. So a couple of things that are notable, telecoms and drugs continue to look horrible. Now, the other end of the spectrum, groups that you might not expect if you're heading into a recession are leading. Semiconductors, builders, insurance companies, Wall Street, okay? banks, steel. These are important groups where we're seeing improving good breadth. Now, there's been pretty good breadth in oil and oil service, but there's been no improvement since the beginning of the month in November. That is notable. And one of the reasons why we took our position down slightly in energy because we are seeing opportunities in some other groups. But there's still things that are difficult. If we take the top seven companies in the S&P, they're up 80% in 2023. And if you X those out, 
the S&P is basically flat. So we're seeing improvement in the rest of the group, but it's very, very early days. So the most important thing to take away from that is it's okay you know, if you've been late to the party and putting money to work, breadth really has only been expanding for a month. Uh, and there likely is a lot of opportunity going forward. This feels very frustrating as a portfolio manager, because of course, there is no portfolio that's concentrated in seven stocks. But this doesn't last forever. If you go back over the last 65 years from the beginning of the S&P 500 1957, Market cap weighted index beat equally weighted index only 25 out of 65 years. So the relative return for a cap weighted, which is where we weight the biggest stocks based on their size versus an equally weighted index, you know, over time actually did a little worse. So if we take a look at the years where there was the biggest differentials, you can see that in certain years, 98, 69, 99, 72, and so on, you know, market cap weighted, like this year, outperformed the equally weighted by varying amounts. But if you take the other 10, it goes the other way. 2009, the equally weighted S&P up 47% versus the cap weighted up 26.5. Uh, that was the first first year of a new bull market, right? You can look through this list and see it's not always the case. I've had people say, well, the biggest always lead and the smallest don't. That's actually not the case. So that's why we care about breadth. When we see breadth expand, it means that things underneath the surface are improving beyond just the biggest companies. Now, from an earnings perspective, we're basically through third quarter earnings. Uh, and as we got through 482 of 500 companies, I think the most important data is that earnings surprised on average by 7.7% above estimate. And you can see here the degree to which we beat estimates. Companies were not beating estimates as much going through 2022 and 23. Now they are once again beating. I think that's really important. Let's talk leadership. Uh, technology continues to lead. Having said all of the things about the big seven stocks, they continue to be very important. Relative strength started to rise after a 30% decline in 2022 in the beginning of January. So it would surprise me if many people had full weightings in these big companies going back to early January after they were down 30%. We certainly didn't. In fact, it took us till about March to build good-sized positions. Uh, and relative performance, this line here, relative to the S&P has been rising ever since. We're sitting at new highs for the XLK ETF, which is made up of the biggest tech holdings. Software has been the strongest within the technology space. We made a new relative strength high today in the IGV ETF. Uh, it's up sharply over the course of the year. You can see the companies in this list, Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe, Oracle, Intuit, ServiceNow. We own Palo Alto. We own ServiceNow. We own Adobe. Uh, we own Oracle. We own Microsoft. So some great companies here. They are companies that tend to have pretty predictable growth. They're companies that generate a lot of cash. They don't need any funding. So this fits the world where funding is expensive. They don't need funding. In fact, they could fund. And these companies, many of them pay dividends. One thing we are watching is semis relative to software have performed less well. Our big weights have been in Broadcom, AVGO, and of course, NVIDIA. We also own uh, Intel. They perform very well, uh, but not quite as well as a software group. Moving on, uh, financials. So this is a battleground sector. This is the insurance group, KIE is the ETF for the insurance group. You can see relative strength started to rise in June and July of 2000, uh, uh, of, of this um, uh, 2023, uh, and has been rising since. On a relative basis versus the S&P, it is outperforming, and we're at new 52-week highs as of yesterday, pulled back a little bit today. 
if we compare insurance to banks, insurance relative to banks are steadily outperforming and have been now for about 18 months. In fact, if we go back and look at the very long-term picture, banks relative to insurance stocks peaked out in 2008. Now they had some relative outperformance over the last 10 years, but you can see over the last two years, banks really significantly underperforming, which is why we have very little in the bank sector as we sit. We're about uh, one major position in JP Morgan. Fairfax Financials, from a momentum perspective here in Canada, has been behaving better than every other insurance company. It's property and casualty. We've talked about it a few times on, on our webcast, and it, you know, it continues to perform well. But banks relative to the S&P are at new all-time lows on a relative basis. So at this point, they have been unable to pass along the increase in yields and loans and make an interest margin because they've seen deposits go out the door into money market funds. And certainly in Canada, it's been no difference. So Fairfax on one side, doing great, trading at 52 week highs. On the other side, here's Scotiabank, uh, reported earnings today, very disappointing uh, numbers, uh, taking provisions against potential uh, loan losses and very high expenses in their uh, retail bank which is probably one of the reasons they're going through restructuring, uh, sorry, uh, uh, taking uh, taking charges uh, for layoffs, uh, but we have no Canadian bank exposure. A very unusual thing is, as a Canadian money manager, the banks are such an important sector. They're just not performing, and the dividends may be good, but total return at this point uh, looks questionable. Energy. Rising relative strength since the market lows. We've seen a number of pullbacks along the way in relative performance. We certainly saw consolidation while the Fed was tightening. Uh, we saw um, a nice run up uh, over the last few months. And again, a relative pullback in the last few weeks. We'll see, we've taken our exposure down slightly because there are other things to do. Uh, but frankly, the technical setup still looks very, very good. We've come out of a bear market that goes back to 2014. Uh, we think that there's great cash flow generation here. We're going to see good dividend growth. Uh, and so we're going to have a little bit of patience here. The uranium stocks in the energy space are doing better. The URA this week made a new relative strength high. URA is the ETF that owns uranium producers. U.UN is the uranium spot uh, uh, ETF. They own physical uh, uranium doing very, very well. And certainly the chemical, the, the, the uranium producers performing well. Industrials, industrials equally weighted versus the equal weight S&P, you know, continues to outperform, really led by a number of things, not, not the least of which is defense stocks. Uh, so for those that are comfortable holding them, we do have some defense exposure. And when we get to materials, go back to uranium. Uranium has been very, very strong. Cameco is just a beast. Uh, it just continues to, to mark its way higher. We also have exposure to Next Gen Energy, which is a, a smaller cap <laughs> uh, company with, with uh, significant you know, upcoming production. Steel continues to act well. Very, very close now to breaking out. Again, go back. This is a long-term chart, 2012 through 2021. A higher low in 2020 versus a low in 2016. This does not look very recessionary. Now, it may just be that we're redrawing supply lines and reshoring manufacturing to the U.S. It may be that the spend on infrastructure is, is certainly, you know, buoying prices. But to me, I don't think people are positioned in steel companies, given what how people feel about the outlook for the economy. I think this is important to always look at and say, <clears throat> You know, do we recognize what is happening as opposed to thinking about what we think should happen? Steel stocks are acting particularly well. Outside of steel, metals and mining stocks broke out of their consolidation over the last couple of weeks. I think that's important. Again, a very long bear market can support a significant move higher in price. And as I mentioned, gold breaking out uh, on this monthly chart 
is important. And we also have seen bullish percent or the percent of stocks and uptrends bottom for the precious metals in October at 14%. So meaning only 14% of stocks were performing well at the low ebb and breadth has started to improve. So let's just use this as a case study. Our job isn't to have a hardened opinion about a group. It's to be flexible. When we see breadth start to improve, like we did in October of 2022, you can start with a position. And the job isn't to go and find something that's been beaten into the ground. We like to say, what is there, despite the fact the sector's been out of favor, is behaving better than the rest? So here's a couple of examples. In the gold sector, one of our positions is Kinross Gold. So Kinross is a $10 billion market cap in Canada, about a $7 billion U.S. market cap. Closed today at a 52-week high, trading better than 92% of companies in the S&P. So remember, take a group that's under own, see improvement in breadth, find a company that is showing improvement technically and fundamentally, and start with a partial position. So Kinross stands out. Alamos Gold stands out, $5.7 billion market cap trades both in New York and in, in Toronto. 2023 estimates for 54 cents, 93% improvement. Uh, and certainly cash flow is improving. And again, better than 92% of companies in the S&P. And El Dorado is another. Again, trades both in New York <clears throat> and in Toronto. Uh, really nice breakout today, trading better than 95% of companies in the S&P 500. And I can tell you, this is a group that is universally hated. So um, our job is to always look for new leadership. Uh, and this group really is starting to behave you know, pretty well. Moving on, uh, communications continues to see rising relative strength. That's Google and Netflix uh, and Meta. <clears throat> In consumer discretionary, we really don't have a lot. We have the Costco. We have Uber, which we talked about last week. Uh, but I will say... The percent of stocks and uptrends has been weakening over the last few months and really not seen much by way of improvement. Uh, so we are cautious here and keeping an underweight. In the drugs, again, very focused, just in two stocks, <clears throat> Eli Lilly and Vertex, uh, for obvious reasons. So when we boil it all down, we are pretty fully positioned. You know, we have an 18% weight in technology. It is an underweight because we think that there's other things to give us some relative value. And you can see there's other groups showing nice improvement. If the equally weighted S&P starts to pick up some steam, some of these other groups are gonna be pretty important. We have an overweight position in financials, which has grown over the last month. <clears throat> this is made up largely of insurance, but we also talked last week about Visa and MasterCard, which are showing some real strength versus the financial sector. Energy, we mentioned we've taken down a little bit, not a lot. It's an overweight position relative to the S&P and about the TSX weight. These companies are generating a lot of cash and we expect to see dividend growth. Our bond holdings are down over the last month, not because we think there's something wrong, but as I mentioned, we had a lot of money in bonds that we had there for short-term uh, cash flow. And we thought we might use them for other things that could benefit more if rates started to come down. Materials is a 7% weight, triple the S&P weight, which arguably is a very small weight. We think this group is really under owned and pretty, presents really good risk reward. <clears throat> Industrials, we've taken up a little recently, just adding some more defense holdings. Healthcare, just some very specific holdings in Vertex uh, and Lilly. And then when we go to the bottom end of the spectrum, real estate is void, utilities is void, communication services <clears throat> an underweight, and consumer discretionary for staples underweight. We think that we are in a market <clears throat> where there are some groups that are really under owned, that have the kind of characteristics that do well in a more reflationary environment. And we wanna make sure that we're positioned for the next two to three year rally given the fact that uh, volatility is falling and breadth is improving. Now, evidence that things aren't getting a lot worse in the economy. This is the 
credit spreads or the excess return a corporate bond investor is demanding to take corporate risk, you can see the spreads are narrowing. So this is bond investors telling us they're not concerned about some kind of big collapse. In fact, <clears throat> investment grade spreads are at new relative lows. So the S&P is very close to making a new high. The month of December has a history of being a pretty strong month, especially when breadth is improving. You can see there's lots of things to do that are behaving better than the market. And as we mentioned before, we think in general, people continue to be under positioned, seeing money having coming out, been coming out month by month by month over the course of the last 12 months out of markets. We highlighted over the last couple of weeks that when volatility or VIX drops to below 20% and stays in a range, it tends to be a period of time when stocks do really, really well. Well, we've seen lots of volatility since the COVID sell-off and the various spikes in volatility since. But we're now down into a lower volatility regime. If it's like history, it's likely to stay here for a while. We know that, that uh, systematic investment managers have put a lot of money to work over the last month, but continue to have more to put to work. We think that most private investors have very significant cash weights and probably are hoping for a pullback that may not come. If something changes, we'll certainly get more defensive. And we've got a history of doing that. But as it sits right now, we think it's really important that people not ignore this turn. So um, keep doing these every week. Uh, Pam, we can answer some questions if there are some. Uh, people don't, don't hesitate to follow us on Twitter at Barometer CA. We post a lot of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, if you're looking for additional information, certainly you can use this QR code uh, to find out a little bit more. But we're always happy to chat. Pamela, any questions? Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, David. Alejandro, one of our dedicated viewers, David, is curious about uh, the breadth of the Chinese market. He wants to know, David, do you think the Golden Dragon stocks, and specifically BABA, are trading below their intrinsic value? Or do you see further deterior deterioration for this group of shares? You know, it's 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 very tricky because, you know, it continues to be a market where there's a lot of outside influence other than just the business. The geopolitical risks are are not insignificant. Um, if I put up uh, Baba on the on the screen, you know, I'll just make a couple of points. So, <clears throat> look, relative strength. Uh, not a very pretty picture. Uh, in fact, we're hitting new relative lows as of today. So it may well be a great company. And it may well be that the, Jap that the Chinese market shows improvement. Um, but having said all that, you know, you've seen decelerating growth. 2024 estimate is supposed to be up 11%. Do we trust it? I don't know. 2025, 7%. Um, that to me isn't exciting. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have exposure to Japan. We have exposure to India. We think that the geopolitical risks there are lower. Um, we don't have any Chinese exposure at this point. Now, it's great that they are stimulating. And it is great that they are working at fixing some of the problems in their real estate market and that they're committing to see all of the stopped projects from a building perspective get built because that can be good for copper uh, and it can be good for other materials. Uh, but as for direct exposure to China, we have virtually none. Thanks so much, David. The next question comes from another loyal viewer, Stephen from Toronto. He says, David, uh, it seems a little odd that we're sitting on cash in income and in the balance pools. Why would that be? And his second question is more energy focused. He wants to know what makes energy so attractive when prices have softened, dividend increases or one-time returns to shareholders? 
Look forward to your views on that. Those two questions. Yeah, so so look, um, here, here's the thing. Um, and we've gone through on the charts, the free cash flow that's being generated by these companies. Um, when we look at a long-term picture of, of uh, like Canadian natural resources, you know, I, I understand their skepticism when you've, when you've gone through a period, you know, 2008 through 2021, where you didn't make a new high. Uh, and through that period, you know, investors moved on. I understand it, but let's just look at it, right? 2008, as a group was making highs, CNQ earned about $2 and 60 cents a share. So, 2022, $8.25 a share. Now, the estimates are a little lower because the prices have come down a little bit. But in the process, they pay down their debt. Now, this is a company that's going to grow its dividend 20% a year for the next three, four years, unless we see a very significant fall in energy prices, which doesn't look like at this point. Um, we think that maybe there's a, a floor around $70. The uh, U.S. still has to fill its reserve. Uh, and uh, I think that you're probably going to see a little more action by OPEC at their next meeting. Um, if I can get it, get something that's going to pay me just about 5% and grow the dividend 20% a year, that's pretty attractive. Now, there's all kinds of examples in our portfolios of positions in this sector that are generating a lot of cash, that have strong balance sheets. They're not going out and punching holes in the ground with the cash or returning it to shareholders through buybacks and dividend growth. So historically speaking, when uh, the commodities group has been out of favor for a decade and has become under owned and there has been consolidation and discipline uh, put in at the board level, it's a really good time to be an investor. So uh, this, is, this is something that we think we want to be involved in for now, but there's certainly other things to do as well. Thanks so much, David. The final question comes from Richard. He wants to... Uh, oh, oh get... sorry. I, I didn't answer one question, panel. The oh, okay. question was, why do we have a little bit of cash? Yes, in, in income and balance pools. Yeah, so, so look, first of all, you know, I tried to talk about this uh, last week. Um, when you see markets reverse off a low, the first little while can be misleading. So there's some clear things that have led up to the point where you saw a market reverse. And there will be some groups that have underperformed badly that have really sharp rallies. And the really sharp rallies in those groups tend to come from short covering. They tend to be people going back to the thing that made money before that they've now lost a bunch in. So, you know, as an example, you know, when, when the, tech rec bottomed in 2003, people raced back into tech stocks because that's what worked. And they did work for a few months or certainly a few weeks, but then, you know, other groups took over. So uh, it's good not to put everything to work all at once. As I mentioned, the equal weight S&P has underperformed badly. I mean, really badly over the last 22 months. And as things start to improve and we see improving breadth, like today in the last couple of days in precious metals, those are watershed changes. And I'm gonna guess, and I know for sure, that we put a little money to work in one of them today. And it, it's a group we don't have a huge weight in, but I'm glad to have some cash to do it. Um, so, you know, it, it's very possible that tech will remain the only thing that works. But you can see from the relative strength charts we've looked at, it's not the only game in town. There are other things to do. And we don't have to race to have every dollar put to work. You know, having a little bit of cash over the first six weeks of a rally that might go on for three years is not a terrible thing. That's not going to be the determinant of success over three years. Thanks so much, Dave. Getting back to our last question, Richard here, he says, uh, David, I love your weekly updates. Thank you so much. Looking for your thoughts and views on IWM. Yeah, so the IWM is a Russell 2000. Um, you know, here's here's a very long-term picture. We'll take a shorter-term picture. This is weekly chart. 
This is relative strengths of the group now. Bullish percent for the S&P mid cap index and bullish percent for the S&P small cap index have started to show some improvement, but we still have work to do. But this is a range, sorry, this is a range that uh, that uh, the IWM, IWM was in from the lows uh, in 2022. We broke those lows. Now, why is that? Well, part of it is, you know, there are some concerns about the consumer and there are some concerns about financials, banks in particular. <clears throat> the IWM has a lot of banks and a lot of regional banks. It also has a lot of companies that are unprofitable and a lot of companies that need debt. So as we've talked about, we want to make sure we own companies that can fund themselves, that don't need expensive debt in order to grow. It happens to be the Russell 2000 does have a lot of companies in that boat. So uh, when we look at the regional banks, the regional banks are the banks that are filled with uh, commercial real estate. Commercial real estate picture, you know, in my opinion, doesn't look so great. So I can understand why the index, the way that it's made up, um, you know, might might give it a bit of a disadvantage and where, you know, rifle shot individual positions that are maybe within the index might be a better approach. Thanks so much, David. That concludes the questions we've received this afternoon. So as always, I'll leave you with the final word and look forward to seeing you next week. Same time, same place. Okay, well, listen, we, we certainly appreciate uh, folks uh, signing under this weekly. You know, we started doing it just specifically for clients. And, and uh, I think it's an important tool for us to be able to communicate with people so they can hear exactly what we're thinking and what we're doing and to make sure that the portfolios line up with what we're talking about and what we're seeing going on in the market. Um, having said that, it's a, it's a good way for us to make it clear what we're trying to get accomplished. Uh, it won't make sense for everybody, uh, but where it does, you know, we hope to find like-minded people uh, to talk to. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you've got questions about the portfolios that we're managing for you now, or if you have questions about what you're doing on your own, uh, and maybe you want a second opinion, we're certainly happy to talk about those things as well. So um, we appreciate you, you tuning in and we'll be back again next Tuesday. And in between, if you're, if you're interested, you know, we'll continue to post stuff on Twitter uh, and, uh, and send some stuff out. So thanks so much. And thanks, Pam, for, for being the moderator. Thanks, Dave.